Um, hi everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, presentation about artificial intelligence and automation. Uh, so my name is Hadi Harp. Uh, the, the main objective here is to, to try to inspire you on how you might use artificial intelligence and connect it to automation to control in general industrial applications. Um, now our uh, topics that we'll be covering today are basically what is intelligence and artificial intelligence. And this is a way for us to, um, um, to, to really start thinking about what do we mean by intelligence and by intelligent unit or entity. And then uh, what's the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And then we'll be getting into the terminology. And the terminology for us is, uh, to ensure that whenever we read or we see something about artificial intelligence, we clearly uh, identify what uh, what it means, what it's meant by, because there are some special terminologies that are used here. And then if you want to start today to build a, an artificial intelligence system, so how do you do it? And so this is what we'll be uh, looking uh, into next. Uh, what kind of tools you might use and what are the steps that you would follow? And finally, some case studies. So here, the case studies that I selected are uh, from normally industrial automation, uh, so that we can see the link between artificial intelligence and uh, industrial automation, uh, so automation in general, and another one case study that is kind of interesting uh, in terms of interaction between a human and a machine. So this is what we'll be uh, covering today. Uh, now, just a few words about myself. I was introduced to artificial intelligence in 1998. And this is where I created the first artificial neural network. And I had the chance to see artificial intelligence from different perspectives. So I saw it as an engineer and I used it as a tool. I worked with artificial intelligence as a researcher. Uh, and uh, so this is where I saw how we can improve artificial intelligence algorithms how we can be inspired by how humans do uh, in order to improve our techniques. And then I had the chance to, uh, to see artificial intelligence from an entrepreneur's point of view. So how to uh, make a business out of artificial intelligence. Uh, basically, it was about recommending uh, music to people, uh, basically, so selling more eventually um, music. And then I uh, saw artificial intelligence from a uh, consultant uh, point of view, uh, where uh, I had the chance to deal with different companies and uh, see how they can solve their problems using those artificial intelligence techniques. And uh, during all of this period, so starting from 2000 and 2001, probably, I, I was always doing some lecturing at different universities. And now I'm, I'm doing mainly the lecturing at EIT. So this is a, um, a background of uh, how I saw artificial intelligence, how I ex experienced artificial intelligence in the past. So from different perspectives, as an engineer, as a researcher, as an entrepreneur, and as a consultant. And this is really, so I had really a good ch chance of doing this. Now. Let's start first with uh, artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence? Now, first of all, what is intelligence? Because we want to build machines that are intelligent, but what is intelligence? Uh, so is it have, um, having a consciousness? Uh, and then what is consciousness? Uh, consciousness, is it something binary so that we humans have consciousness and other entities they don't? Uh, or is it something like from a minimum to a maximum so that you have different levels of consciousness? Say a, uh, a, a, a very, um, uh, so a, a cockroach, for example, has some con consciousness and we on the other extreme have another uh, consciousness and then you have a lot of animals that are in between the minimum to the maximum. So question here, what do you think? Do you think that consciousness is something that's binary or is it, uh, a continuum from a minimum to a maximum. What do you think?
So is it for you something really binary? We have consciousness and any other entity, they don't? Or is it something, uh, uh, okay, Langa says binary. Continuum, continuum, continuum. Okay, continue. Minimum to maximum. Okay, I, I, I see that uh, basically you, uh, you agree with this non-binary definition of consciousness, which is uh, to some extent uh, uh, what we might uh, see. In fact, there are animals that are self-aware. There are animals who can uh, plan for the future. So uh, we cannot consider these as like non-conscious, okay? So is this intelligence, is it consciousness? Well, great, we are very good at consciousness. We humans, we are like the best. Uh, now, another point is, is, is intelligence about solving problems or in particular complex problems? But in this case, what's a complex problem? Is it calculations? Because if it's about calculations, a dumb calculator is much better than our human brain. Uh, is it about recognizing objects? This is a complex problem, looking at an object around you and identifying that this is a car. This car is of this model. Uh, this is the manufacturer of a car. Well, we do this very, very easily, we humans. But for a computer, even for a supercomputer, it is still some challenging, some, some uh, a, a challenging problem. Uh, is it about making abstractions? Well, this is where we humans excel. We create concepts, we look at the world around us, we create concepts, we connect those concepts together. Uh, so for example, we can create a concept of something called a uh, family or friendship or something called a country or a, a, a university. Uh, and then we, if we exchange information about those abstractions and those concepts using language, very, very complex. And this is what probably distinguishes us from other animals. But then when, when you start dealing with language, with concepts, with interaction between humans, uh, so some very complex concepts, which is using abstractions, now machines are getting closer to us. And finally, if you want to build artificial intelligence, so we want to build intelligent agents, basically these are software agents, uh, and then finally they can, uh, they can act on some actuators, so the essence of intelligence is the software part. So how do you gauge intelligence? So we created an intelligent machine, how do we know that this is really an intelligent machine? So, the first uh, type of test uh, that comes to, to, to the mind normally of people who are working in this, this environment is this called the Turing test. It was developed or imagined by a uh, mathematician, uh, an English mathematician in the uh, 50s, or so Alan Turing. So the idea here is you, you say that a machine is intelligent or it will pass the so-called Turing test is if you have on one side a human operator who is interacting or a judge who is interacting with something on the other side. So they will just type in some text and then they will be receiving back the text, it's like chatting. If the human operator cannot distinguish a real human from a machine, well, we'd say that this machine passed the Turing test. So this is like, seems to be a good gauge of intelligence. Um, but you would be surprised that there are a lot of chatbots uh, that are basically in this category where you can chat with them, you can ask them questions and they will respond. They will give you the impression that they are kind of sophisticated, relatively smart, probably they wouldn't pass the Turing test, but they are kind of smart. But in reality, it's, it's very simple. It's just rules. If someone says hi, say hi there. If someone says, how are you, say, et cetera. And they give like really impressive results. So even though Turing test might be um, seen as a, like the ultimate test where a human operator cannot distinguish between a machine and another uh, human, systems that exist today that will let you interact with them 
uh, and will give you this feeling of being intelligent are not necessarily very intelligent, as you might imagine. Okay, so this is a first test of intelligence. So now, one category of systems that are already built, and we use them all the time, are in this, in this environment. Oh, these are the chatbots. These are the um, smart assistants that we have on our smartphones, etc. So all of these, they fall in this category. They give us the impression of being intelligent by uh, interacting like we humans would interact. Uh, but be reminded that it's not really they are thinking like we think, we humans think. They are just trying to act like humans. So this is the first test of intelligence. A, a second test of intelligence is um, thinking like a human. So see, Connor, uh, if there's a question asked, could AI find an answer even if it's not predefined in the code? Uh -huh. And this is exactly, Connor, where we would have the challenge. For example, um, IBM Watson was a system uh, that was developed by IBM in 2011 or so, uh, was very good at question answering without really predefined uh, code or telling the, the machine how to answer. It was analyzing the question, looking at databases, a lot of different databases, and trying to find an answer which is what, by, by the way, Google is doing when you search something on Google, okay? So it's a way to find the knowledge somewhere in, in human knowledge in text and then trying to, to create an answer that looks like an interaction, like if it was a human who is generating this answer, okay? And yes, this is, this is possible. It's, it's done with the so-called natural language understanding, okay? But... Uh, the majority of what we see as those chatbots are not. They are mainly predefined answers that, uh, that are implemented. Okay. Now, a next type of uh, intelligence is, or intelligent machine, is to create a machine that thinks like a human. This is really very exciting. In fact, uh, when I said I, I uh, discovered and I learned about artificial intelligence in 1998, it was about a book that I saw that was called Artificial Neural Networks and Computer Intelligence. Uh, and the thing that really attracted me was the brain on one side and computers on the other side. So a lot of people are really inspired by this. So the point is to look at what we know about the brain, the human brain, which is like the ultimate definition of intelligence for many people, and then um, being inspired by it to try to emulate it create systems that do things as we know the brain is doing. This is where you see techniques like artificial neural networks. They are inspired by how the brain, um, or how we know, or what we know about the brain, how it works. So um, uh, these are called connectionist approaches. So these connectionist approaches, they are inspired by how the brain works. And what's great about um, artificial intelligence in this domain is, the brain will tell us, or our understanding of the brain will help us create better neural networks, so better systems. And the models that we create on computers, they will help us understand more the brain. And so, so it's, it's a work that's done in, in both directions, okay? Artificial intelligence learns from human intelligence, and then understanding human intelligence is, to some extent, could be based on what we know on artificial intelligence. Very exciting category here. Okay, so the, the terms that you see like something called deep learning. Anyone is familiar with this term here? Deep learning. Are you familiar with this term, deep learning? Yes, yes. Yes, great. Great. Victor, no. Yes. No, yes. Okay, great. And deep learning is basically um, artificial neural networks that are inspired by how we know the brain works or what we know about how the brain works. Okay? So it's called deep learning. Okay, great. So this is to show, and, and uh, when you look at the hype around you right now about artificial intelligence, Almost everyone talks about deep learning, this term here. 
machine learning and in particular deep learning because it's more exciting to say that we do things similar to how the brain works than just writing some code so um, it works well from a marketing perspective now the other way that you can create intelligent machines here you don't really look at how the brain works or we might say we don't care how at the biological level it works uh, we just think rationally or create a machine that thinks rationally it will it will use logic it will use mathematics and this is also some of the um, um, uh, distinctive features of of us humans we use logic for example we might say something like this we have a rule that says all humans are mortal right if you say x is a human so i categorize it as a human i can infer that x is mortal this is applying logic and we are very good at it uh, using mathematics so the fact that you can use mathematics you can use mathematics to optimize some uh, some configuration for example you can optimize a control action by a controller so that you get the best of uh, of a system that you are working with like uh, by producing the right speed at the right time um, so this is about uh, thinking rationally okay so in this case we might create machines that are like uh, they use logic and there there are machines that use logic in fact the, in the the early days of artificial intelligence it was the hype everyone talked about implementing machines that can solve mathematical problems like we do apply uh, logic and and infer things like this here if all humans are uh, mortal and x is a human so x is mortal and solve things like uh, like puzzles in a logical way okay but then uh, exactly as victor says here but about, what about creativity okay so creativity here creativity let, let's say about creating some music okay so probably it's not like logical deliberation that is behind creating music sometimes well, this is what creative what creative people do but victor is still even creativity so even creating music uh, for example some something like music we are creating it because we want to uh, like want to be something that pleases humans on the other side so you might find some rules of how creativity links to something that is uh, uh, rule based in fact there are right now techniques that will create music just by listening to all other uh, previous music and they will they are able to create music that will seem interesting by the way okay so in other times, creativity, it, it could be seen as like producing all possibilities and then just picking up from these possibilities something interesting to a group of people, to a certain problem. And artificial intelligence, you have techniques that are just good at this, okay? Searching in uh, different ways on a lot of solutions and then picking up the right solution, okay? Now, all of these... Um, like definitions of artificial intelligence are things that already exist so people are developing systems that can uh, think and act rationally so they can optimize they can apply logic uh, they can search in a smart way uh, they can think like a human so these connectionist approaches deep learning neural networks etc and they can act like human so we can interact with them in in an easy way these are question answering systems starting from from google or search engines down to uh, our uh, smart assistants now these systems in fact could be called weak ai or specialized ai and in these systems uh, what is done is that for a specific problem they can do or they can be as good as we are as humans even better for example, doing calculations, a calculator is much better than we are. Uh, these specialized systems are called weak AI. They're, they solve real-world problems. 
we are already using them. We see them around us and uh, we can start applying them. And this is what we'll be seeing just in a moment. But still, there is no single agent, software agent or entity that can do everything that we do, we humans, as good as we do. When we arrive at this level, so we create a software agent who is able to do all, or to solve all problems that we humans can solve from dealing with language, from doing abstractions, from solving mathematical problems, from predicting the future, uh, from self-consciousness or uh, being able to recognize our existence and putting ourselves in a model and predicting how what we will be doing in the next month and the next year and 10 years from now, how our actions today will affect what will be seen in the next uh, one day, one next month, next next hour, next year, next decade. So all of this is what we are good at humans. So the day we arrive at an artificial intelligence or a, a, an agent that can do all of this as good as we do it, this will be called strong AI. So here, act and think like a human or solve all problems that a human can solve. Uh, in fact, when you see fantasies about AI in movies, uh, well, this is about strong AI, something like here, like Terminator. We are still relatively far from this, okay? And there are, there are people who are concerned about strong AI because if you are able to create a software agent who is as good as a human in all aspects, it's like you are duplicating humans. It costs almost nothing, it just costs energy. Do you agree? Copy your software, provide some energy to a computer and you are creating a human. So the cost of creating these human-like is very low compared to um, a, a human uh, teaching a human, and uh, uh, so it costs a lot, a lot more. And now the question is, if this AI is as good as we are, so it has a conscious, well, some kind of consciousness, it can, uh, it recognizes its own existence, and if it is slightly better than we are, so it can improve itself. And if it can if it, it can improve itself better than we can improve it, or better than we can improve ourselves, we'll get really behind. And if we get behind, there are people uh, who are uh, starting to be worried about like AI taking over the world and, and things like that. Okay, but still we are uh, relatively far from this. Okay, and there's a, a a domain called safety in AI that deals just. Uh, with this, this problem. Now, since we are talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence, let us just compare what's a human intelligence versus machine intelligence. Because when we say artificial intelligence, we are using computers. Computers use silicon, so you use transistors. Now, in a computer, you have approximately one billion silicon, something like this, in the billion, so 10 to the power nine, in terms of transistors that are used as the unit of computing, okay? In uh, humans, what is used are neurons. Here, this is a representation of a neuron. So these neurons, they are cells that are connecting, connected to each other, and they transmit signals. These are electrochemical signals that are transmitted. And this is how thinking is done, or is thought to be done. How we receive sensors from around, around us, using our uh, vision, sounds, tactile uh, sensing, odors, etc and how we make decisions. We get to making decisions and creating thoughts and storing uh, knowledge, memories. So it's using those elementary units that are the neurons, okay? Here we have about 100 billion of them. Then in terms of storage, in terms of memory. So memory in computers, this is basically you use RAM, okay? The random access memory where you store all of your programs, all of the variables, etc. We are around, like 100 billion uh, units of them. So we have 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, something like this. This is the order of magnitude that we deal with. In human intelligence, the memory is the connection between neurons. In fact, if you have two neurons, neuron one, neuron two, the connection between them is called a synapse. This synapse could be strong or, or weak. 
this information, so how strong two neurons are connected, is a kind of knowledge. It's a kind of, um, of storage of memory. Okay, so if you learn a lot of things, for example, you would notice that some neurons will start to be connected strongly to other neurons. This is how we learn. So it's, it's how we store information. So these are the synapses. We have 10 to the power 14 of them, approximately. But now if you get to cycle time, so how fast we can do computing, on a computer we deal with nanoseconds, 10 to the power minus nine. On our, in our brains, it's in the millisecond. It's much, much slower. But still, there are things that we can do. Uh, we humans are much, much better than a, a machine can do, like dealing with, with language, concepts, uh, understanding, generating language, understanding objects, doing abstractions, uh, stereotyping, by the way, which is something that normally we see as not good in many situations, like when we stereotype. But this is a very good. Uh, function that we apply and it helps us survive this stereotyping and we're very good at it okay so all of this is when humans much better than in machines even though it's much slower okay so Catherine says uh, how do AI develop consciousness well this is like uh, the question of uh, probably of not all uh, of the decade or uh, of the century, it is the question. Absolutely, Catherine. It's, it's, it's not at all easy because we are not even, we cannot easily define what consciousness is. Okay? The more we learn, the more we, did, we, dis we, dis we discover that consciousness is not as we thought it was. For example, if you go back 100 years ago, people thought that humans are the conscious beings and everything else is not. But with new research about uh, animals, so people are starting to see that there are animals that have some, some, some level of consciousness also, okay? Or some people would call it it's self-awareness. But it's really not easy. Uh, and by the way, we talked about how humans are um, so how what's intelligence in humans affect everything that we do uh, all of our feelings our uh, ways of thinking that we think it's like very special very unique if you we dig deeper about our knowledge of how things work in our brain it's all about signal processing it's information processing we have information getting in information getting out um, and there are some uh, ideas that even this consciousness is like a byproduct of solving these problems, input output problems. Okay. Uh, Martin says currently humans are creating machines. Is there a possibility in the future that machines will create humans? Uh, my personal opinion, yes. There's no reason why uh, it's not possible. Okay. In fact, ultimately, if you what's a human? If we want to define a human, uh, most probably it's not the body. It's not the biological body that we have. It's our mind. Do, do you all agree that the human is the mind? Okay. Now, if, if really you think about it, really the human is the mind. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, the body, in fact, there are a lot of examples, Jeffrey, that where, um, in fact, the whole body, it's, it's how the mind is creating an image of our body. Okay? It's, uh, in fact, you take an example of someone uh, for whom you wipe out all of their memory. They are no longer the same person. So it's, it's our mind, it's our memories, and then how we do things. This is this is basically what what we are, okay? So uh, so our 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 mind is the essence. Normally, is this is what distinguishes us. And this mind, in fact, it works like a like it's like a computer. Okay, we have storage, we have converting inputs into output signals into uh, into actions, signals into concepts, concepts into actions, into feelings, etc. Okay. So Victor says, uh, with quantum computers, uh, yes and no, Victor. In fact, machine performance will improve. 
but still what's what's blocking the development of like general artificial intelligence that's called strong ai it is more of um, the method how do we do it because as you can see here humans are doing better in terms of consciousness in terms of intelligence with less so we have notice here cycle time in the milliseconds computers are already in the nanoseconds okay so it's like the method we didn't find yet the method okay to get something as intelligent as a human so it could be like by copying the whole brain structure it could be something like this okay uh, Ponzo says, uh, why is that human tend to forget some things and they acquire new knowledge? Absolutely. In fact, this is one of the main attributes of human memory compared to machine memory. Um, now, why we have to forget a lot of things? Because the input that we receive in terms of information is huge. Just imagine how much signals, light signals you are receiving each time you look around you. It's really huge. The same for sounds. So our brain cannot really cope with everything a human will see during a lifetime. It's it's impossible. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you do the calculations, it's impressive how much data we receive all the time. It's imagine that you're just picturing taking an image at I don't know like 1,000 per 1,000 pixel. It's one million pixels, and if one million pixels, every pixel is represented by few bytes. It's few million bytes per what? Per uh, 10 milliseconds, per 100 milliseconds. So just imagine how huge it is. So the brain has this capacity to concentrate on what's important, make abstractions, create concepts, connect them together. And this is what will be remembered in the long term. OK? Uh, Dakalo, do computers have minds? I would, in the state as, as it is right now and how we define what is a, a mind, I think not, no. No, so the, the closest to what a mind is are these conversational agents that we have and they certainly don't, okay? They are basically question answering systems. They search in a, in a kind of database. They try to, uh, to copy how we do. And I'll show an example at the end of a system that was trained on human conversations and it tried to converse, so you can converse with it. Yeah, so you can see what, what kind of conversations you can do. Okay. Uh, David, what's an example of an industrial application for a conscious AI system uh, to solve an issue more productively than, um, than a human? Okay, David, I, I would say, in my opinion, creating, we don't really need conscious AI. We just need AIs who can solve problems on their own. Okay, there's no need for conscious AI. I just need systems who can produce food for us, who can uh, treat us if we are uh, sick, who can uh, do all of the work that that we would have to do. They just need energy. Uh, we actually says humans do not know anything. Everything we know is from memory, something we have been taught. Like when we see, it's all from a giant big memory. Okay. Okay, Lang, I see, I see. Well, um, I would say it's not just uh, memory in the sense that we, 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 we look in memory as we would, a computer will look in RAM and then produce an answer. The mechanism by which we think till now is, is really not known. But most probably you have inputs, you have outputs. It's like our brain's like a black box so far. We know something about it, but there are a lot of things that are still missing. It's a black box where you receive signals from around you. And those signals are the sights, sounds, etc. And this is what we produce here as actions. So the actions, what we produce is what I'm saying right now, how the way I move. Uh, and then what's important is the internal state, the concepts I create, the ideas I create. Okay? So, um, this is the, the interesting part. Uh, Victor, so what is human inspiration then? Uh, there are ideas, Victor, that it's just some, some randomness. Okay, so something, it's really some, some randomness in, in, in our brain that will, boom, uh, create a, uh, a trigger and an idea somewhere, and then you can start 
uh, using it, okay? And by the way, to get inspiration, one of the ways to get inspiration is to try to look at a, um, for example, you pick up a dictionary, you pick up any word from this dictionary and try to connect it to a problem that you are trying to solve. This most probably will, will increase the creativity, your creativity in solving this problem, okay? It's basically creativity and inspiration. It's basically to trick our brain and tell it, do not use the patterns that you already know, okay? Because it's, it's, it's like a trap that we have in our brains. They create patterns to, to make decisions faster for survival, by the way. It's, it's, all, it's, it's to make decisions very fast for survival. And inspiration is about breaking those patterns. Okay, so as can a machine function without a human? Well, absolutely, yes. They, they are already functioning without humans. Okay, now the question is, can a machine improve itself to do its work better continuously without a human? So far, no. Okay, so far we humans, we need to, 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 to do actions. And we'll see in a moment, if you want to build a, an artificial intelligence system today, you would always start by defining the problem. You would start by gathering data by labeling the data. Well, this is what we humans do first. We design the system, okay? The day where we don't have to design the system, the system will design itself. Now, uh, this is what we'll be calling probably strong AI or artificial general intelligence, okay? So um, applications are like autonomous vehicle and autonomous vehicle can, can do its job on its own, okay? Um, but you have to define. So what do you want this, autonomous vehicle to do basically we give it a target okay uh, uh, Sam is that possible for a conscious AI learning and design addition function that was never taught to the machine in fact we don't really need consciousness for this Sam there are already applications where you train the machine to do something and then uh, you keep it learning and it will it will be impressive to see uh, what it learns okay so it's not really thought to do something, it will solve the problem in a way we've never thought of solving it, okay? So uh, it's already there and we don't really need consciousness to, to do so, any conscious AI to do so, okay? For example, in uh, even in uh, autonomous vehicles, you can define some rules and then you will notice that the autonomous vehicle will find up, will find up a, a route, will find a, a way to uh, to avoid a um, a collision in a way that you we humans didn't think of. Okay. Uh, is there a will to create a machine that can prove itself without humans? Uh, uh, clearly, in fact, this is like one of the the things that excite people, or researchers, and engineers in this world. Absolutely. And this leads us to the risks. Uh, Solo, so what are the risks of AI? Well, the risks here, basically it's about the so-called strong AI or artificial general intelligence. It's at the moment where you create a machine who can do everything that we do as good as we are, okay? So, and there's research about safety AI. Uh, climate change and global warming, Victor, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, th this is like one of the most challenging or interesting things on in AI is to use this intelligence based on silicon that can do better than what, what we can do, for example, in solving these problems, okay? A human can reject any signal message by making a decision about machine if it's not defined to do so. Francois, don't really um, agree, in fact, one of the rules of, or one of the methods of, or ideas behind machine learning is just about this. Let the machine learn from what it sees, and then it can make decisions without you defining of how it should make those decisions. It will make decisions, okay? So, today what do we see? We see autonomous vehicles. It's a reality around us. And an autonomous vehicle can do better than a human driver already. Uh, facial recognition, it's probably all over the place. It's being used and it is getting better than humans. Speech recognition also is getting very good, as, as close as humans so far. 
uh, virtual assistants. It's already good, we use it. And uh, there are a lot of people who would not recruit an assistant, a human assistant, because the virtual assistant is already sufficient. Forecasting, we see it a lot. It's used from predicting what, what kind of uh, products will be used in the next month so that you can make those decisions in your production to predicting uh, uh, weather. It's, it's all over the place, this forecasting part. Diagnosis, medical diagnosis. So this is one of the tasks that uh, people are proud to say, well, we should be smart, be a medical doctor, for example, or a radiologist. Well, already uh, machines can do better. In some areas, they can do better. Okay, they can analyze uh, medical images, for example. They can make decisions, a diagnosis that is better than a human doctor. Okay? So this is a reality. It already exists. And you have a lot of other applications. Some of them that we'll be mentioning today are in industrial automation. So just some cases uh, that personally I, I was uh, so uh, familiar with. Okay. Now, terminology used. So we, 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 we talked about intelligence, artificial intelligence, etc. Some of, of the terms that you see when you deal with artificial intelligence are this. Machine learning, which is the ability of the machine to learn. So the point in machine learning is we don't have to program the machine to deal with every situation. I want a machine to learn, for example, to recognize danger. I don't have to show it every dangerous possibility. I probably could, should give it a few dangerous situations, few normal situations, and tell the machine, you have to learn. And now, if it sees a new situation that never saw before, it has to make a decision between dangerous and non-dangerous. This is machine learning, okay? So we don't program the machine to do everything, we just program it to learn, and once it learns, it can make decisions on its own in the future. In this machine learning, you have like three categories of learning. Supervised learning, where we supervise the learning. So we tell the machine what a car is. We tell the machine what a human is uh, and what a danger is, what a failure is. So we are going to supervise it first. In unsupervised learning, we don't. We just throw data on the machine. We, we for, format the data in a way that the machine can understand can, or the algorithm can analyze. And we ask the machine to find patterns, to do clustering. We are very good at this, we humans. It's, we, we find relationships around us. So the, the idea is to let the machine find those relationships. And then you have the last, also very exciting method. It's reinforced learning. This is how we train, how we humans, by the way, we learn, and how we train animals. It's reinforced learning. So you create a machine or an algorithm that will act on its environment and it will try to maximize rewards. Here, there's a missing word, rewards. So we define what a reward is and the machine or the algorithm will try to maximize rewards. It will try all possibilities and finally it should find a strategy to maximize its rewards and this strategy is learning, okay? Like asking the machine, to learn how to play a game just by looking at other people playing a game, something like this, and or by trying to play a game with someone. It will play again and again and again and again. Each time it, try, it, it tries different strategy, if it wins the game or it wins parts of the game, it says, okay, this seems to be a good strategy. I'm going to, to uh, continue on this strategy. If not, it, it will start removing the strategy. And we have still, we have already machines that can do this. Now, in terms of supervised learning, you have the classification, something called classification. The classification is about giving labels to samples. For example, I have a sample like this. This is a sound sample. At the low level, it's simply pressure. It's air pressure at every time instant. Say every 10 milliseconds you have, or every one millisecond or below that, you have air pressure value. This is it. And this is how our ears are doing. They are receiving this air pressure are starting to vibrate, uh, so the inner ear, and then this signal is transmitted to the brain and we make decisions. Now, it's impressive how much you can get from this signal here. Okay, this is like the input, it's called an input. It's the way we represent the signals, like air pressure, but uh, more things that will be done like filter analysis, so frequencies, low frequency, high frequency, etc. 
uh, things that you can do by analyzing a sound or classes. Well, is it a human? Is it a machine? Is it a uh, an alarm? Is it a baby crying? And then, if is it speech? If this is speech, who is talking? Uh, what's the feeling of this person? Is this person angry? Is this person happy? Is this person sad? And what they are saying? All of this from these signals. Really very impressive, okay? And this is a classification problem. So we'll be giving the machine the signals and then we'll be telling the machine, I want you to learn that this means sad. Okay, I give it a lot of examples. This means sad, this means sad, this means sad. And then if someone new will be talking and will be speaking with the machine, the machine can say if this is sad or not. Okay, and the same for words. You might say this is the word hi, etc. Et All of this is classification. You have other examples like handwritten uh, written recognition. So here you would write A, I can write it differently. I can write it like this, like this and the machine should identify that this is eight, the number eight. Like here, an image. So here we would identify that there's, there's a face and the face for, I don't know, Maria. Okay, this is classification problems. Classification problem could be something like this here, identifying a word like apple in a sentence and classify this as an organization. Okay, this is a classification problem. So for all of these problems, most probably will be applying the supervised learning, meaning we'll be telling the machine first, giving it examples of the inputs. This is the input, how you represent the sample and the label. We give it sufficient inputs and labels, inputs and labels, we train it, and now we would have a machine who is already trained so that you can give it another sample that the machine never saw before and it will make a decision, it will classify. This is called classification, so labeling. The other part is called regression. It's also in supervised learning. Regression is where the output is not a label, like man, woman, uh, sad, happy, no. It's a value. An example, we want to predict electricity demand given uh, the day, the hour, the month, and the temperature outside. Once again, we train the machine, we give it examples. These are the inputs. These are the outputs, we train it, and now we can ask the machine, if we are Monday, 10 a.m. in February, uh, temperature is seven degrees Celsius, what is the electricity demand, okay? So uh, this is, in this case, uh, a regression. We learned to predict a value that's somewhere between a minimum and a maximum, okay? Uh, so, Xolo, what, what do you mean by 4IR? Pierre, I, I guess so, but probably Caroline will answer. Okay, fourth industrial revolution. Okay, it's uh, it, it's basically at the essence of it. It's at the center of it. It's basically data analysis. Okay, and we'll see some examples in a moment. Okay. Now, uh, in regression, a lot of examples like forecasting, pricing model. Uh, for example, I would I want to to calculate or to create a model uh, to predict or to estimate the cost in a project given some parameters. This is something that we can do. Predict if um, the precipitation level given some measurements. Okay. Uh, that kind of difference between machine learning and deep learning, this is the same. Deep learning is part of machine learning, okay? And it's just a category of techniques that use artificial neural networks, okay? And all of this is within the, the class artificial intelligence, okay? So machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a type of techniques. Deep learning is one technique within machine learning, okay? That kind of? So, you see here um, application of, of supervised learning in time series analysis. So, predicting the future from the past, very, very common. You look at past production and you try to predict the future, future value. Stock exchanges, it's, it's already used. 
it's used also in production. So we want to predict uh, what would be your production in the future based on the past. And then you have the unsupervised learning. One typical example is class clustering. Here, we don't give a label to any entity. For example, we take measurements of humans. Height, mass, height, mass, height, mass, height, mass. We know nothing about. We ask the machine, can you find some natural clusters here? Well, the machine might say, okay, great. I, I can find that human one and three, they seem to be different from human two and four. Or probably here we have males and females. Probably one and three, they are males, and these are females. Okay, so here the machine can do this on its own, do this clustering, and uh, this is basically uh, the interesting part of, uh, uh, of the unsupervised learning. It learns on its own, okay? Now, uh, clustering, you can use it in clustering uh, your, um, cl your customers, for example, so that you can target a message to different customers in different ways, and it's done automatically, okay? Now, unsupervised learning, it could be about knowledge representation, creating ontologies automatically, analyzing text and creating links between sentences, identifying that Madrid to Spain is the same as Paris to France, and it already exists, okay? So all of this is already um, existing. Now, reinforced learning, reinforcement learning, it's as I mentioned before, it is how you create an agent who can interact with its environment, take actions, and look at uh, increasing its reward. So it will be receiving punishment and encouragement, and based on this, it will improve it will build the stretch and it's already used. It's already there, okay? Now, if you, tomorrow you want to build a, an artificial intelligence system or today, you know this always, you start with data gathering. And then you have to do some, some treatment of the data, pre-processing, cleaning, etc., labeling the data if you are supervised learning. Okay, so you give an input, an output, you select the right variables that you want to look at. This is called feature selection. You train a model, and now you have your system. If you are dealing with unsupervised learning, also the same. You start with data gathering, data pre-processing, feature selection, and then model training. So here in supervised, unsupervised learning, we have to define some kind of similarity functions. How can I say that person A is similar to person B based on what they watch on TV, for example? And we would have our uh, our our system that is that's already trained. Uh, reinforcement learning, here it's trickier because you have to define what's performance, you have to define what's a reward, and, uh, but it already exists, but it's, 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 it's relatively trickier here. You have to create a world that is very limited for this agent to learn. Now, some of the techniques that exist in artificial intelligence, all of these here. When we say deep learning, it's basically this, artificial neural networks. Now, if you look at artificial neural networks, in fact, it's, it's kind of simple. We produce an input here. These are, say, measurements, temperature, pressure, etc., and they produce outputs. These outputs are failure, non-failure, etc. Okay? And this is inspired by humans. These are like neurons, and these are like synapses, inspired by humans. And at the low level, it's very simple. A neuron is simply summing the inputs and producing the output. This is it. The output is a function of the sum of the inputs. Very simple, and yet we can do things impressive. Okay? So the main idea in um, this artificial intelligence, uh, artificial neural network is to let you give a label to a new sample that you've never seen before, given what you already know. So if you know all, already all of this, the distinction between red and blue, and I'm giving the orange point, I can give a decision based on this, okay? Now, just now, let's take a look at some tools that you can use. Well, Python, very commonly used. And, and you see here TensorFlow, Scikit-learn, et cetera. These are part of Python. You can use Weka, you can use MATLAB, and you can use all of these cloud-based solutions to start working on a system. Just to show you here, our, our objective in this uh, webinar is not to, to build code, but just to show you examples of codes. If you go to TensorFlow, 
uh, with uh, the right configuration of Python, etc. Here's a code that will let you create a system that learns how to classify images into T-shirts, trousers, pullovers, dress, coats, etc. Just to show you the code, here it is. These are the types of images that you'll be given. And here's the actual code to learn. Very simple. This is it. Okay, you create an artificial intelligence system. Very simple. Another tool that you can use is Weka. This is a graphical user interface. You can download it from here. You just have to provide the data in the right format, and you're done. You have a system that is uh, that can learn and can make predictions, can do supervised and unsupervised learning. You can use MATLAB if you, you are um, in science and engineering. Most probably already use MATLAB, and MATLAB is has a, a very good toolbox for machine learning. So to summarize, which tool do you use? Well, it depends on what you have. Um, do you have experience in programming? Do you need flexibility? Do you have experience in MATLAB and R or no experience at all? Well, we can make a decision here. Okay? Now, let us just rapidly see some examples of cases. So these are some examples. Now, obviously, uh, we didn't spend too much time on the tools that, that you can use because it's, it's building a complete system. Um, now, in terms of applications, here's predictive maintenance. This is an example. In fact, it was a math thesis at EIT uh, that I supervised. And the idea was to detect if there's a failure in a certain valve or a system of valves in an engine based on measurements. It was a success. And here's an application. Now, this is a real practical application in the industry. Now, some measurements are were taken, like speed like pressures at different points like temperatures at different points like the output power like the air temperature and from this a label was given fail no fail so this is an incredible uh way to improve maintenance so that maintenance will be predictive maintenance we know if the system is failing and if it's failing you can um you can deal with it Okay, so and here are examples uh, where the system predicted failures automatically based on the measurements. So these are the inputs that produced an output here. Okay, works very well. Another example is in predictive control. And this is one of the applications where you deal with the level in a, um, in a boiler. So a boiler, what a boiler does, a boiler produces steam by boiling water. So we have water here, and you have fire, so flame, and you produce steam. Water gets in, some cold water will get in, and steam gets out. We want to keep the level, say, around 50%. We don't want it to be too high, we don't want it to be too low. Now, this seems to be a, a complex problem in engineering. To, to ensure that the level is always where, where it should be because uh, sometimes the effect will take time. You don't see an effect, so we will be uh, pushing more water in and then all of a sudden the water level is too high. So here, this is also another uh, master thesis at DIT where uh, it was about predicting what the level would be in the next few minutes given the current knowledge right, right now. So the controller now can make decisions based on what would happen in the next few minutes, not based on what it's seeing right now. This is predictive control. Okay? And here, this is another example. It's uh, motor bearing fault detection. This is for electric motors. These are vibration data from accelerometers that are on the motor. They were analyzed, and then here, this is a neural network that was used. In all these methods, these are neural networks that were used, artificial neural networks. And the system was trained to, to learn to identify outer fault, raceway fault, ball faults, and normal bearing. So different types of situations based on just vibration data of an electric motor, so that a fault will be detected way in advance. OK? This was also a, a success. Uh, can the computer predict uh, maintenance by using from past events? Absolutely, Victor, absolutely. So this is the idea of this predictive maintenance. In fact, you can train a machine to look eventually at maintenance logs, at failure logs from the past, plus all measurements that you, that you have, 
and make predictions so that in the future the machine will tell you this or the system will tell you this machine needs maintenance right now it will fail in the next two months for example okay so we'd have predictive maintenance now and the predictive control is like applying pid control so typical feedback control but not on the current measurement that we have but on the future which is the predictions now here's an example uh, so i tried it here data is, is already available it's to generate it's, uh, it's uh, the link here it's the market demand electricity market demand in spain okay so we can use it to make predictions in the future here it was i trained the system that learned from the past, all of this past, to predict what would happen in the future in terms of uh, electricity demand. And it works quite well, okay? So this is your learning from the past to predict the future. Here's an example also where, uh, also you can, you can download data from here to predict sol solar radiations from these. This is also an artificial neural network, okay? And it works quite well. Now, Here's the last example, uh, just to make it um, interesting. This example, I trained a system. It uses a type of neural network it's called recurrent neural network, which is a neural network that will make a prediction based on its current state and what it's seeing right now. So its state is always changing. Uh, so always the future that will be predicted is based on the current state and whatever input that you do that you give, which is the past also. So I trained the system on movies. I took conversations from movies, really millions of turns, in fact, tens or hundreds of millions of turns between um, conversations in, in a lot of movies. I trained it to predict the output, so what person B would say if person A says something. Okay, trained the system, pure training, no rules at all. So no rules. If someone says hi, you should say hi there. Not at all. And then I started to converse with the system. And here's how uh, one example of conversation. Just to show you, this is, a, this is, this is really machine learning. It, a system that learns on its own by just analyzing conversations in movies. If you say hi, it says hi there. Where were you last night? I was in the bathroom. What's your name? My name. Yes, your name, please. My name is John. How are you today? Fine, I'm doing great. Do you like to go out with me? Sure. I like you. I like you. I love you. You know that. I love you. Let's go grab a beer. Come on. I got to go now. Bye. So all of what you see here, these answers, these are generated by the machine automatically given the question and given the previous questions also. Okay, so this is a conversational machine that was created all purely by training. Okay, so this is machine learning. Now, just to finalize today's session, so where do we, from now, what do you do? And how AI can affect you? If you have data, which is something that is already there, we already have data on, by using smartwatches on our health, we have data in sensors, we have data in, um, in computers and databases, we already have data. If not, we can just add a sensor, it's very easy right now. If you want to make predictions about the future, I want to predict uh, what will be production in the future, I want to predict if a machine will fail, I want to predict if uh, performance will be good in, under certain conditions or not, well, in this you can use AI. And some of the techniques that we saw today could be used. Um, if you not you want to do optimization, this is where AI also can be very, very uh, certainly used. Optimize, optimize productions, optimize positioning of antennas in a certain area to make the best coverage, uh, optimize control actions. All of this you can you still use AI. So all of this is specialized AI or weak AI. So we can benefit from AI even though we are still far from general artificial or artificial general intelligence okay so this is it for today thank you everyone